Welcome to Louisiana Business Spotlight. I'm Jeff Cruer. A great program lined up for you today. We're going to be joined by two of our legislators, the State Senator Conrad Appel. Also, we're going to be joined by State Representative Kirk Talbot and Mr. Mardi Gras himself. Uh, the legend author Hardy is going to be joining us, publisher of the Mardi Gras Guide. We'll talk about our upcoming carnival season with author Hardy. But let's start with some of the top news stories we're following right here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. Ochsner Health System has acquired uh, New Orleans Urgent Care, adding two more locations to its network of non-emergency medical care sites. Now, the deal uh, involves uh, New Orleans Urgent Care Centers at 900 Magazine Street in the Warehouse District and also at 201 Decatur Street in the French Quarter. A vacant theater building near the Esplanade Mall here in Kenner is destined for demolition. So its new owner can proceed with plans for new development, a 256-unit apartment complex. Clay Companies of Baton Rouge has closed uh, on the purchase of the former Hollywood Cinemas 9, which closed uh, back in June 2013 after the nearby Grand Theater Complex was open. The developers intend to begin the official process in the next few weeks to tear down the older theater building. On the North Shore, the Kmart store in Mandeville is one of 64 in the national chain closing within the next few months. Sears Holding Company, which operates uh, Kmart stores, says it's closing 103 stores around the country, including the 64 Kmart outlets. The Mandeville Kmart, which is on uh, US 190, was one of the first businesses to locate uh, at what is now a busy commercial area in the heart of the city. A Holiday Inn Express uh, in the heart of the CBD has been sold for $21 million to uh, Austin-based JMI Realty, which is a private real estate investment and development company. The 129-room, six-floor hotel is located at 334 O'Keefe Avenue. It was sold by Garrison Investment Group, a real estate investment firm in New York, which had bought it for $10.75 million back in 2014. All right, let's delve into what's going on in Baton Rouge and how it's going to affect us here in Jefferson Parish. State Senator Conrad Appel is going to be joining us next right here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. There is a session coming up. We could have a special session. We'll definitely have a regular session. And let's talk about it with our state senator, Conrad Appel, joining us. And, Senator, how you doing? I'm fine, Jeff. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. Uh, yeah. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, is it a happy New Year for uh, the state of Louisiana fiscally? Well, I think we're at a crossroads, and I think we're, uh, we, we're presented with an opportunity here. Um, what you may see and what you're hearing from the governor is he just wants to raise taxes to basically refund and expand government uh, but remember, we're last in every measure of success uh, as far as states go. So you have to wonder if this isn't a great opportunity to reconstruct, to recreate Louisiana and get us moving in a different direction. And so that's, that's why I'm a little bit optimistic about this, thinking that we've got that chance now. Uh, if we just allow ourselves to be fooled into pouring a whole bunch more money into the system, uh, I can assure you that 10 years from now we'll be having the same conversation. Because the, the words uh, that we keep hearing, uh, Senator, are fiscal cliff. Uh, we're about ready to go off the fiscal cliff. Uh, that's, is that accurate? Well, I mean, the definition of cliff is if you want to maintain the status quo, there's a cliff. Mm -hmm. If you want to fix the situation, then we have a financial issue to, to a component, let me call it, of that fix. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't call it a cliff. But if you assume that we're going to continue the way things are, we want to grow government, then suddenly you've got a cliff. So the media loves that word, it, that we've got a disaster right. coming. I don't think we have a disaster. So uh, is the projected deficit about a billion dollars? Well, I think it's actually going to be less than that. Um, mm -hmm. the, the original number was around a billion dollars. But if you've seen recently, uh, state revenues have ticked up about $200 million this year, general uh, tax revenues. Uh, and also, uh, just this week, uh, we saw where uh, they've identified potential of another $250 million of additional revenues as a result of the federal tax laws changes. Keep in mind, that's from personal taxes. There's another component, which is corporate taxes that they have not calculated. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, we're optimistic that it's going to be something south of uh, a billion and substantially south. 
Now, what is the status with that sales tax? It's a temporary sales tax increase, right? Correct. Uh, and, and when does that uh, end? It uh, expires at the end of this fiscal year, I believe, uh, okay. which is in June, the end of June. Or the so, of June. Uh, what's going to happen there, you think? Different? Well, that's what's creating this, this point of conflict, the cliff on one side or the opportunity from my mm -hmm, perspective. Mm -hmm. And that is we've purposefully put in a time frame on that because we couldn't negotiate with this governor back uh, two years ago uh, to get any meaningful reform in the structure of government. So we said, okay, we'll just continue and we'll try to do something over the next 24 months, 27 months actually. Um, nothing, nothing's come of it uh, except constant pounding um, for more taxes, more taxes, more taxes. Um, it's time to recreate this state. We're dead last. How many times do we have right. to hear that? And how many times do we have to hear from a governor tell us, oh, just give us a lot more money so we can continue being dead last? Now, the, the sales tax, we're first in sales taxes, aren't we? We are <laughs> highest in sales taxes, that's right. correct. So, but I'll tell you that I have had zero calls in my office complaining about sales tax. Really? None, and I have talked to countless legislators and they have not had any calls about it either. I'm not supporting the highest sales tax right. in the nation. Right. What I'm telling you is it, it isn't a giant problem apparently for the people. I haven't heard that. So you think it's easier for people to pay as they buy as opposed to getting socked maybe with uh, like high income taxes, high I, property taxes I, at one time? That would be my assumption. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I'm not getting any calls about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, but that's so is there a compromise available on the sales tax issue? Oh, absolutely. We don't have to pass uh, any sales tax extension. We don't have to, we could do a partial. There's also uh, the cleaning of pennies you've he you heard about, which basically eliminates exemptions on uh, some of the existing sales tax. There's all these different moving parts. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first thing you got to do is determine what you need to spend. Right. If you listen to the governor, it's give me money to spend. If you listen to us, it's Let's decide what's a reasonable amount of money to spend, and then let's figure out how we divide, let's divide that money. Let's talk about spending, because I saw a report sure. that showed that per capita-wise, we spend more on state government than other southern states. In some areas, yes. Mm -hmm. Not all areas. Not all areas. Yeah, I can tell you in education, for one, for many years, we were the highest or the second highest per capita in the South mm -hmm. on per student uh, mm -hmm. education spending. Some of the other areas, we're not. So it's a mixed bag there as far as spending goes. Bag, but yeah. if you were, um, you know, working with the governor and said, hey, uh, Sandra, come on in, let's cut this budget, where, where would you start targeting? Well, for instance, I am not one in favor of the movie tax uh, uh, credits. That's which cost us $206 million this year, every mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. We've spent well over a billion dollars. Uh, we can't pay for our kids to go to college, but we're spending hundreds of millions to send money to California. I. I don't think that's good. I don't think it produces long-term uh, effects. You can go down the list. Uh, a, a bill that I think you'll see this year, probably, because I'm probably going to do it, is one on long-term managed care. We know from some studies that it would save between $100 and $200 million a year, the first year, by allowing seniors to be able to stay in their own homes. But the nursing homes are a very powerful lobby, and you know, you know the result of that. We've, mm -hmm. we've had problems trying to pass that. There's lists of these things. Uh, there's some short term, there's some long term. This is an opportunity right. to start addressing them. How about uh, consolidation of higher education, uh, boards, uh, yes. other types of uh, uh, reform efforts? Uh, we seem to have a lot of universities here. They're in close proximity to each other. Uh, I think other states you know, do it differently as far as uh, you know, serving their population. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that a potential area we could save You might money? remember that I tried to recreate the university uh, in the New Orleans region by right. merging Suno, Uno, and Which Delgado. Which I think was a good idea. Would have saved money, but more importantly, it would have done a much better job of education. And that could have been a start for other efforts across it, the state. It would have been a model. The worst, yeah. the most ex uh, extreme case I know of is in the northeastern corner of the state where there are three, four-year right. uh, doctoral universities within 30 miles. Mm -hmm. And hardly anybody lives in the Northeast. It's an agrarian part of the right. state. Right, sure. It makes no sense. Uh, but it does make sense from a political perspective. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. So you ran into a, a political uh, freight train when you tried to do that, right? That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the right thing to do. And I think right. today you would, you would see um, 
a far better structure of education in the New Orleans region than you have uh, by having three separate universities. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I couldn't pull it off. I tried. Yeah. I got really close. Is that something that can be revisited at a later time? Um, it would be fruitless under this governor. Oh. There's no chance. It would be a waste of, a waste of time. This, you got to remember, the governor we have today is, uh, wants to, to basically use the structure of government we have and expand on it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to talk about reform. He doesn't want to talk about, for instance, a perfect example is the inventory tax. A few years ago, we, uh, the state of Louisiana was sending $450 million a year to local governments to reimburse them for inventory tax. Makes no sense. He won't talk about it mm -hmm. because it costs political capital. So, I mean, you can go down the list of these things that, that I mean, that Republicans have brought up right. time and time again. And we've had Republicans vote against us, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. It requires strong leadership at the top level in Louisiana. We don't have strong leadership that's committed to, as I say, recreating this state. We have leadership that's committed to keeping the status quo and just spending more money. And, and the status quo has really turned into a problem because I saw a recent statistic that showed that we are losing population in Louisiana. Yeah. Under Jindal, we actually had a net gain right. of population. It wasn't great, but it was moving in the right direction. And right. Uh, since then, we've had about 30,000 um, uh, transplants leaving the state. And that's horrible because yeah. uh, our southern neighbors, they're gaining in population. Well, that's right. The key to government, you know, I like to describe this as the intersection between government and economics. And the key that nobody seems to grasp in this state is the impacts on people is truly coming from the economic side. It doesn't come from the government side. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that you can get a good job. You can build family wealth. Mm -hmm. You can do the things that you want to do. We have this mindset that's just the mm -hmm. most frustrating thing in the world that everybody turns to government. Government, government, government. Instead, we should be focusing on a growing, strong economy. Texas, Florida, the areas around Atlanta, you can go down the list. Many, many years ago, New Orleans was in direct competition with Atlanta and Houston for corporate jobs. We're not even in competition with Gulfport. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I drove by recently, uh, Senator, uh, Canton, Mississippi. Yeah. And I yeah. was blown away. I mean, that plant there is amazing. I think they got a couple of plants up there now. Yeah. And then what that does the is it breeds other, about, yeah. uh, those plants feed on themselves mm -hmm. and you end up with uh, primary manufacturing. You see in Louisiana, we've, we, we're we really excited because we have all this big manufacturing. We have primary manufacturing. We make plastic pellets and chemicals. We don't get into the secondary part like they do in Canton where they have a lot of employment high paid wages, right. and we do the secondary part by creating the products. Is there any reason why we can't uh, compete for those types of uh, plants? I believe there is, and it's, it, it gets back to a lot of philosophy. For instance, we have the worst civil justice structure in the United States, practically. We have a giant red line around us uh, because people don't want to move their corporate headquarters here or their manufacturing facilities because they know they're going to be sued constantly and they're gonna lose and their insurance rates are gonna go through the roof and everything else. And you can, I mean, there's a list. When, when, a, when a company looks at a location to move to or grow in, mm -hmm. they have a checklist, education workforce, uh, tort structure we just talked about, uh, transportation public safety, links, right? public safety, uh, quality of life. It's a list, it's not a very long list. The problem is we don't, we're not able to check off the pluses in those, on those lists we're all on the minus side. So those plants go somewhere else. And so what do we have to do? We have to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into financial incentives to overcome our shortfalls on those uh, checklists criteria. Of, of criteria. Uh, it's not a good situation. Well, we only have about 30 seconds left. Okay. Uh, so are we gonna be looking at uh, a very eventful session? It sounds like there's a lot to do. I think, yes, it's going to be extraordinarily. First of all, it's a regular session, so we're going to have thousands of bills, most of which are meaningless, frankly. Right. Uh, but then we're going to have this issue of the budget, which will start uh, in uh, the House Appropriations Committee, and then we'll finally work its way uh, toward the Senate. So, I, yeah, it's going to be a, a very long, drawn-out uh, session. And maybe and a special session. Oh, I think we'll have a special session. There's no doubt about it. Whether we 
we do as the governor wants and puts it in before the regular session, which I, I am not in favor of, right. or we do it after we've had a chance to try to modify government right. a little bit and then do a special session. Either way, we're going to have a special session. Well, let me just say good luck. Thank you. And uh, we'll be following closely. Thank you, Senator. Well, I sure appreciate it. Thanks so All much. All right. Appreciate it very much. A lot more Louisiana Business Spotlight coming your way. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a very important uh, next few weeks and months here in Louisiana. A lot of major issues going to be discussed up in Baton Rouge at the legislative session. And here with us to give a very important perspective, State Representative Kirk Talbot is with us. And Representative, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. So uh, very interesting that uh, the media keeps sort of building up uh, the fiscal problems and the fiscal cliff and right. the billion dollar deficit and the, the real crisis right. that we're in. Are we in a crisis? Um, you know, we're in a crisis if we don't curtail spending and if we if we if we do nothing. But, you know, um, people look at it. Do we have a revenue problem or do we have a spending problem? I personally think and believe that we have a spending problem. Mm -hmm. If you look at what we've spent over the years, where our budget was years ago, things that we've tried to do mainly from the House Republican side, you know, we have enough money in this state to run everything properly. You know, just to give an example, um, you know, last year, House Republicans, we wanted to hold back 200 million because we knew that this, the, you know, when the sales tax rolls off, I believe it's like $850 million is rolling off. And then I think the cleaning of a couple of pennies is rolling off too, all to a, the tune of, I think, $1.07 billion. But, you know, we know that's, that's coming. So we tried to enact spending reforms. We tried to, you know, hold back $200 million. We're trying to get the REC to give us more accurate revenue forecasts so we don't keep spending, you know, the most amount of a bad number that right. never materializes. So, host of things in that. But as far as, uh, let me ask you about the penny first or the yeah. uh, sales tax issue. So, we have the highest sales taxes in the nation. We do. We do. So, we don't want to continue at that level, do we? I don't think so. You know, um, as a business owner in New Orleans, you know, we have additional um, sales taxes in our business in the French Quarter which makes us really the highest sales tax in the country, even within Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And, you know, other states look at that. You know, conventions look at that. They said, don't go to Louisiana, don't go to New Orleans. They have the highest sales tax in the country. And what are we getting for it? Well, that's the question. Uh, I mean, if the services were outstanding, then right. maybe people would say, okay, it's worth it. But uh, right. since we do have problems across the board, then people are saying, all right, uh, let's give some relief. Uh, so is there a compromise maybe in the offing from where we are now? And You know, I would, I would hope they would be. You know, um, my group or the group that I'm kind of associated with, the fiscal hawks, so to speak, you know, we always get tagged as the ones that won't compromise. It's always the House GOP that won't compromise. If you recall, last year we proposed a budget that held back $200 million knowing that this was going to roll off, trying to ease this fiscal cliff. The governor did not want to hold back $200 million. So we said, look, let's hold back, meet you in the middle at $100 million. He didn't want to do that either. Next thing you know, we spent the whole $200 million, much to our um, dismay. You know, I thought the art of compromise is to meet in the middle and kind of work on something in the middle. But, you know, they went and spent the whole, the whole enchilada, and here we are now where we could have had an $800 million right. problem instead of a billion-dollar problem. So we look at this budget problem right now, and are we going to need a special session to deal with this? Um, I don't think so, because I don't think we need to, to raise revenue. Um, I know that's being talked about, and I believe the governor has set a June 19th deadline. Um, I think it's a flexible deadline, but a, a deadline to decide on, on whether he wants to have a special session. If we do have a special session, I'd like to see some spending reforms. You know, John Schroeder, our newly elected treasurer, keeps talking about, and he was one of the leaders of our group, yeah. keeps talking about it's like we're focusing on the revenue side first. And there are, we do have some issues on how we collect revenue in Louisiana that we need to change, but we need to focus on the spending side, at least, if not first. You know, we're not focusing on the spending side at all, and that's what right. we're trying to get the other side to do. What about these industrial tax exemptions? Uh, are we losing out on a lot of revenue? Are, is this necessary to compete in the business climate? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a, a yes and no question. Um, sure, we're, we're, we're missing out on some revenue, but, you know, it's a very competitive 
national and international market out there for those companies. A lot of those companies don't have to be here. And you know, when, when car plants come here and steel plants come here, they pit states against each other. They'll go to Mississippi and Alabama or Oklahoma and say, if you give us this, well, Louisiana's given us that. So it's kind of like, if you recall, the steel mill in Blanco's <coughs> last term. Um, and to Blanco's credit, you know, she finally said, you know, enough is enough. That steel mill in Alabama went bankrupt, I think, three years after it was built. So, you know, the big companies don't care. They want as much, and I understand, they want as much a better deal as they can get. But at some point, you got to balance, are we giving up too much? But it is a very competitive So where do we stand market. right now? I mean, are, are we giving away too much? Is it just about the right mix? Um, I think we're probably at about the right mix, but, but I think they all need to be looked at on their face every year. We don't need to just give a company an exemption and walk away and never re mm -hmm. revisit that. So I think just like with dedications, tax credits, all those things, we need to look at those every year. Let's talk, if we could, about uh, Jefferson Parish and uh, about maybe some issues that you think might be coming up in the session to deal with our local residents. Uh, are, are there some big things on the um, you know, legislative calendar for Jefferson Parish? I mean, there's, you know, infrastructure is mm -hmm. always a big deal. Flooding, sewage is always a big deal. Um, you know, our capital outlay process in Baton Rouge is very flawed. You know, um, I had a bill a few years ago, I think it was in Bobby Jindal's last term, that would kind of shine the light and, and bring into the light the whole process on how we fund capital outlay projects. Governor voted for that bill, it passed 100 to 2 in the House. Uh, I don't think he even brought it up for a vote in the Senate because I knew where that was going. But that's a bill that I'll bring back this year. And, you know, we need to prioritize the money we spend on these projects instead of having them being politicized and being rewards or punishment for good. Well, and, the governor and uh, can go through there and veto all these different projects. And not only that, what my bill dealt with was the governor controls what gets on the bond agenda. So you can have your project as a legislator in the capital outlay bill all day long. That means nothing unless it's funded, unless it goes in front of the bond agenda to get funded. The governor controls that agenda. So you could get it in the bill, but if you never go in front of the bond commission, it'll never get funded. We're a state uh, representative where the governor's got a lot of power, doesn't he? Yes and no. The legislature gives the governor a lot of that power because we don't exert our constitutional duties as an independent branch of government. Just like with the speaker's race well, a few years ago. Well, at least this time ago. you elected your own speaker. We did elect our own speaker for the first time, and, and hopefully that, that uh, process will continue. But Again, um, you know, yes, with the veto power, you know, he, the line item veto in the budget, which I don't uh, disagree with. I do believe the governor should have line item veto. But when you have that control, especially over capital outlay, that is the currency of power in Baton Rouge. What is the latest with the TOPS program? Uh, I know uh, we had some cuts um, a few years ago that were pretty painful for mm -hmm. a lot of uh, parents. Right, we had that one year yeah. where it was, where it was then, not fully funded. Um, you know, it seems like it's always questionable as to whether the funding is going to be there. Right. Um, there is a, a, uh, a panel, I, I believe they're meeting um, as we speak, they haven't concluded their study yet on how to proceed with TOPS. I think it's very important. It's very important that we fund it. But, you know, the process is, is financially unstable. So we need to do something, either raise the GPA or do it as a, as a loan or maybe a payback if you fail out. Because the problem is you have a lot of students go, they have a great time, they fail out, and they walk away, and they pay nothing. Or we have a lot of students that take advantage of it, and then they go work right, in Right, they Georgia. go work in Georgia or Houston yeah, or Texas. so and we've just educated the workforce of our neighboring states. That's correct. That's so correct. So I would like to see, and I've got two children at LSU, I would like to see uh, the requirements increased. Uh, I mean, right. I, would, I would like them to have to strive for I like, better grades. I like that angle more than means-based, because I don't think you should punish kids because their parents you know, are, um, can afford college or well right. to do if they earn it and they get a scholarship on their own, then they should get that scholarship. Right. But, you know, we cannot be all things to all people. You know, top started out, I believe like 10, 20, $30 million. It's north of $300 million. And that right. comes out of, uh, out of the, the general right. fund. Right. I know it's a big component of it. Uh, we only have about a minute or so left. I wanted to tell you about a statistic that I read that really concerned me and see if there's something that we can start working on it. 
uh, the population of Louisiana is going down uh, again. Right. I know during the general administration it went up a little bit. And I saw some of the other states that are losing population, and you have like Rust Belt states like right. Ohio and Pennsylvania. And we're the only like southern, I think West Virginia might be another one losing population, but none of these other southern states are losing population. So we are obviously doing something wrong here. Well, not only that, we're losing population, but our budget keeps going up. Right. You know, DHH, Department of Health and Hospitals, has gone up $3 billion over the last several years. You know, what are we, what are we getting for that? You know, um, it's all about jobs, Jeff. We need to create a business climate in this state where businesses want to come and give us good jobs. Frankly, I don't see the governor really focusing on that, but you know, that's what we need. We can't give away the store, but we have to create a climate where people want to come here with, with high paying jobs and want to live here. Mm -hmm. You know, we have crime issues in New Orleans. We have, right. um, and in Baton Rouge and in Baton Rouge, you know, um, we, we, we just passed this so-called crime reform package, which I was against most of that. And, and that is a, a scary thing where, you know, we're letting violent criminals out of jail. Uh, and that's my final question here. We want to bring our incarceration rate down, but uh, some of the people that have been released have already gone back right. into committing to, crimes. To in Kenner. And, you know, we have the highest incarceration rate, incarceration rate because we have the highest crime rate. Right. Why do we have the highest crime rate? Because we have a terrible education system. Um, so it all... It all in. kind of intertwines. But, mm -hmm. you know, when we're in Baton Rouge, we're trying to pass teacher tenure, we're trying to get vouchers, we're trying to get kids out of these failing public schools into private schools right. that have a 90 or 100 percent graduation rate. You know, it's frustrating when the people that are complaining about the crime are voting against our reform measures in Baton Rouge. Right. And I guess there'll be some more reform measures introduced this yes, session. Yes, I'm sure okay. they will. I'm With sure they that, will. we've just run out of time. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks Thank for having me. Thank you very much. Me. We'll be following very, very closely. All right, when we come back, we'll talk to the Mardi Gras man himself uh, and talk about the upcoming celebration. Author Hardy is going to be joining us right here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a pleasure to bring on this man. He's an expert on the thing that we love the most here, and that is Mardi Gras. The publisher of the Mardi Gras Guide, uh, just your, your resource you're gonna need for this carnival season, Arthur Hardy is with us, and Arthur, welcome. Glad to be here, Jeff. So congratulations, uh, we've got uh, the latest uh, edition here. It looks beautiful, Thanks. and uh, tell us about it. Well, it's our 46, 46, 42nd anniversary edition, and we're going to keep trying till we get it right. <laughs> a lot of stuff in it. Big year for anniversaries, and we recover uh, both Bacchus and Tux have their 50th anniversary, Orpheus their 25th. So we've got a lot of coverage on that, and take a look at when Louis Armstrong was king. So we try to have some features, old stuff, new stuff, and most of all, what's happening this year, and mm -hmm. there's a lot happening this year. Yeah, and I certainly want to uh, talk about that, but... Uh, the guide, which I certainly want to encourage everybody to pick up a copy. So where can folks get a copy of this? Really any place that sells magazines, you uh -huh. know, grocery stores, uh, convenience stores, drug stores, bookstores, mm -hmm. the few that we have left. Uh, and of course online on our website, MardiGrasGuide.com. We ship orders every day. But uh, the magazine's selling well, and with an early season, you know, the, everything's compressed yeah. into a, a shorter period of time. So there's a lot of excitement already. You know, I um, was at the post office the other day and saw a lot of people there, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, one of the reasons is probably people already mailing out king cakes. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and hey, uh, bakers like Haydell's and all the others hate an early Mardi Gras season because there's fewer days to, to right. make, if you can make 500 cakes a day and you've got a 30-day season, that's not as swell as a 60-day right. season. And this is early, February 13th. It, it can be as early as February 3rd or as late as March 9th, so this is to the early part. 2019 is going to be March 5th, so we'll go from early to late. Right. Well, of course, uh, it all kicks off on King's Day, right. uh, where you have uh, uh, some celebrations around. The uh, Joan of Arc Parade uh, is always fun down yep. in the French Quarter. Yes, indeed. And Funny 40 Fellows, and there's a new streetcar group uh, called the Not-So-Secret Society of Elysian Fields, I think. <laughs> a lot of, lot of good things going on. And each year, it, it's become, 12 Nights become a bigger thing. Right. And then the, the uh, preseason parade starts towards the end of January, and the, the official 12-day parade season mm -hmm. starts Friday, February well, Let's talk 2nd. a little bit about the preseason parades. What yeah. are we seeing there? Well, you know, the irreverent uh, crew of Drew, uh, crew of Drew, crew of Vu, <laughs> Vu Carre, uh, and followed by the crew of Delusion, uh, those are adult-oriented 
parades that are a whole lot of fun. And I, I enjoy the heck out of them, but I would certainly leave the kids home mm -hmm. if you had them. Crew de Vue is just a, uh, an amazing group uh, made up of little sub crews, and they parade in the French Quarter in the Marigny. It's not to be missed, but it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> right. Very satirical. <laughs> yes, yes. And, of course, we've got Little Rascals in, in Metairie and some parades in Slidell. So, uh, but the official legal parade season always begins 12 days before Fat Tuesday. All right. So let's talk about that. So um, uh, tell us what we're going to be seeing this year with the uh, official season. Any newcomers? Not really. Mattery has regained the crew of uh, Pandora, which paraded one year, took last year off, and they're back. And, and let's talk about Metairie for a second. There's, there's some neat things, of course, Family Gras that first weekend, uh, and that's always exciting. Second pr weekend now, we're going to have a triple header on Sunday. We've never had that before. The crew of Athena that used to parade on Friday night, the first Friday, jumped to the Sunday, the final Sunday of the season. Napoleon's always that day, and now Pandora's coming back, but not on Monday night, Linda Grubb, but the night before. So we're going to have three parades back-to-back -back in Metairie, and that's a reason to come out and see them. You know, three together right. is a pretty power, powerful right. lineup, really. Uh, the route is pretty much the same? It is the same, except Excalibur's not going to do Bonneville this year. Uh, the crews have been talking for years about whether or not there are enough people there to justify riding, and uh, Excalibur felt that it's not on that first night. Mm -hmm. uh, the other parades will still do the Bonneville Loop. Right. And, uh, of course, we've, we've seen over the years sort of uh, a dip in the popularity of the Jefferson Parish. Yes, we have. Yeah. Do you think uh, things might start moving in the other direction? I hope so. The crews are trying. The parish is trying. Uh, let's face it, Veterans Highway is not St. Charles Avenue. Right. And so many people have had the opportunity to jump ship and go to downtown New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's hurt quite a bit. Uh, I always lobby for a, a parade, a night parade on Metairie Road. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think that would create a lot of interest. But uh, they're trying real hard. And, and I, again, I think this triple header on the second Sunday is going to right. be big. Now, what about in the other suburban areas? You also have pockets of parades. I know there's a few in, on the North Shore. Yes. Slidell's got quite a number, doesn't it? Yes, and Slidell, uh, the very popular and new parade of Poseidon. This is the third year they've become a night parade. Mm -hmm. And they're just blowing it out the water. You mm -hmm. know, they've got about 500 members, 610 stompers are in it. Uh, it's, it's really a fine parade. They started big and they've gotten bigger and better. And we've got a couple in, in, uh, in Mandeville and in Covington. So there's parades on the North Shore right. and some people never make it to New Orleans or Metairie. They stay over there. <laughs> now the West Bank used to have a decent number of parades and that has dwindled over the years. Only two. Yeah. The first Saturday, Adonis, which parades in New Orleans and Jefferson. This, and on Endymion Saturday, Namtok, which is an African American club. Really big and fine parade. Uh, and they're on Demi and Saturday, only in Algiers. Mm -hmm. Very big in the community philanthropically. They do wonderful work. Uh, they don't, it's a lot like Zulu in that they don't just parade. Mm -hmm. They give back a lot of the community. Right. And NAMTOC stands for, do you know? Uh, tell us. New Orleans' most talked of club, <laughs> NAMTOC. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. So, of course, and then your Orleans Parish your parades, uh, that St. Charles Avenue route so popular. Um, Is it ever? Yeah, and of course brings out uh, huge crowds. What are we looking at this year, Arthur, as far as economic impact? Uh, will it be different because of its, an, or its early uh, season this Jeff, year? Jeff, typically in early Mardi Gras, it, the hotel occupancy is not as high because spring break doesn't coincide with it. However, the tricentennial this year will bring in some new, new people, new blood. Right. So it, it's hard to predict. I don't think it'll be significantly down or up. Uh, it's been pr pretty flat for several years, but flat is good. Right. If you're hitting the, the upper 90%, that's as good as it's going right. to get in hotel occupancy. Now, we haven't had parades here in New Orleans for 300 years, no. but we have had them for over 100. I mean, well, they started in 1872, didn't they? 1857, 1857. the first Columbus Parade oh, wow. uh, at night. Rex started in, in 1872, first okay. day parade. So for almost, well, for more than half of our 300 years, we've been parading. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, uh, it's something everybody looks forward to. And uh, I've got some friends coming in, uh, excited about it uh, this year. Any um, parades that we lost over the past year? No, no. This is the first time in several years we, we've wow. gained a parade and that we, we got Pandora back in May. And why do you think that is? Because for a number of years, we had been losing uh, yes. parades. I think it's, it's kind of settled off now to where, you know, anybody who can't make it is gone and the people that are there are solid. Uh, the real explosion, Jeff, has been in the population of female crews. 
the membership is so high in all the female crews, it's really something. And uh, of course, Muses is uh, so popular, and, and Nick's, and, and so well, many others. Well, Nick's just passed Endymion in members. They're That's now incredible. the biggest club in Carnival. That's amazing. More than 3,300 women. Wow. And uh, they have tandem floats, and if you separated the floats, there would be 88 floats in this parade. So it's really something. And you know, the women have taken over, and I'm all for it. <laughs> Iris is still there, uh, doing More well. More than 2,000 members. Just celebrated their 100th anniversary. I had the pleasure of publishing a coffee table history book of that club. Right. And uh, they're, of course, the oldest female parade. But I miss Venus. We do, too. They were the first. But, you know, the first captain of Venus also founded Iris. Right. And uh, so they're 101 years old now and going strong. And uh, you mentioned Muses. Cleopatra's up to 900 members. It's wow. just really amazing to see the explosion in, in female carnival. Now, well, we've got some celebrity monarchs uh, coming in. I know Spike Lee is going to be uh, with Zulu this yep. year, right? And this is not his first time, but uh, he's always a big draw. Mm. And uh, J.K. Simmons will be Bacchus. And mm. people don't recognize the name, but they'll recognize the oh, face. Yeah. Academy Award winner in the uh, insurance commercial. Yeah. Bum, 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 right, bum, right, bum, right. bum, 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 <laughs> That's him. And, of course, Rod Stewart and Jason Rollo in uh, Endymion, right. the extravaganza at the Dome, which is going to be a, just a big, big blowout. Right. Uh, if you don't have your tickets now, <laughs> you better get them soon. Right. And uh, I've got a daughter that is uh, looking forward to going to that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's excited about it. Uh, any uh, newfangled throws or anything you're hearing about this year or uh, anything different coming from the float? Yeah, well, everybody's trying to do a signature item now. You know, mm. Carrollton is doing decorated shrimp boots and, and that's kind of cool we've got nicks with the purses and muses with the shoes and cleopatra with the sunglasses everybody wants their own item uh, rex for years every float has had a crew signature bead cup and plush pillow so uh and there's a whole new wave of doubloons now that are, that are actually in shapes that are not circular carrollton has a shrimp boot doubloon and it's not it's not a coin but it's it's a doubloon shaped like a shoe. You know, as a kid author, I used to collect doubloons, used mm -hmm. to love them, and uh, then they just sort of lost popularity. That's and, right. And now, are they coming back a little they, bit? They are a bit, thanks to this new wave. Because, you know, when I rode, if, and I haven't ridden in a few years, but last time I rode, I had a lot of people yelling for doubloons. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are some collectors out there who will bring, you know, signs to each right. float. But uh, I like this new trend of these, they're called cutout doubloons, and uh, Nick says some done like purses, and it's really neat. They, they don't fit into your doubloon books anymore. Remember we all used to have doubloon oh, books yeah. with those circular cutouts? Yeah, but uh, I think it's neat. So of all the different throws, mm -hmm. uh, the most popular is still the beads? I don't think so. I think it's it's these crew signature floats. You know, pe people have become very jaded. You know, I don't want a cup or a doubloon. I want three of those. You know, what what is this, Walmart I'm shopping at? You know, I mean, people will come up to your float and with a list. This is what I need, you know, mm -hmm. come on. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, it's really changed. Uh, yes, over it the has. Years, We've over become the years. spoiled. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, it's big business, it's big fun. It uh, you're the expert on this. And how much fun for you to be able to cover this uh, for these years? You know, I've, I've been in television since 1986, and I really thought at some point I would burn out or get tired and say, hey, here we go again. But I tell you, when that first float comes, I'm a kid again. You know, mm -hmm. it, it makes us all young. And I enjoy it. I don't think I'll ever get tired of it. It's so a whole lot of fun. So we're going to see you this year on uh, Fox 8? Yes, we'll be covering a bunch of parades, doing some, some feature stories, and uh, I enjoy it very much. And, of course, we do the Endymion telecast from the Dome and on the street uh, on that Saturday night, which is uh, February 11th yeah. this year. So the key is going to be if we have good weather, ah. uh, we'll see the big crowds, right? That's it. The one wild card, uh, the last time Fat Tuesday was... Uh, on this day was World War II, there was no parade, but in 30, 1935 it was February 13th, 67 degrees and no rain. Wow. I'd take that. <laughs> oh, that would be ideal. But we can't control it. Yeah, and we never know. No. Author Hardy, it's been a pleasure. Congratulations Thank you. Thank again. You, Jeff. And uh, we'll look for the Mardi Gras Guide at uh, sites around town and uh, watch for you on Fox 8. And we appreciate you being with us. Happy Mardi Gras. Happy Mardi Gras. All right, when we come back, some good news stories here to talk about on Louisiana Business Spotlight. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now let's focus on some good news stories in our local business world. 
Entergy Louisiana is starting work on a second phase of a $69 million infrastructure upgrade to electricity to transmission lines on the West Bank. It's aimed at improving power distribution from Bayou Signet to Harvey. Now the project, which is expected to be complete uh, in June, will include some road closures and some planned power outages, according to Entergy officials. The former Macy's building in Kenner Esplanade Mall has been purchased by the new owner of the uh, shopping center. Pacific Retail bought the 2,078,000 2 square foot building in mid-December for $1.8 million. Pacific Retail has owned the mall since 2016. The store has been vacant since the spring when Macy's shut down 68 locations across the U.S. And hopefully now there will be some redevelopment at that site. And U.S. crude oil production is flirting with record highs as we start the new year. Thanks to technological nimbleness of shale oil drillers who have unleashed this crude bonanza. Now, U.S. oil production has averaged about 9.6 million barrels per day in 2017. The highest U.S. production ever, based on monthly government data, is right about 10 million per day, which dates back to the 70s. Production hit uh, 9.58 million barrels per day in May of 2015. Then prices started to drop because of the oil glut. Now, the resilience of the U.S. oil producers has come as the price of crude rose above $60 per barrel on world markets. And that should be good for Louisiana's economy. Okay, if you have any ideas or comments about topics or potential guests, please contact me at jcruair at gmail.com. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jeff Career, and I'll see you next time for another edition of Louisiana Business Spotlight.